Hello. Today I'm continuing with the uh, Friday the 13th franchise, and today I'm going to talk about Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. Now, this is a film that is really not uh, well liked by the franchise. Uh, a big obvious clue is the title, you know, Jason Takes Manhattan. And the film takes place primarily on a boat, because while originally written for a good portion of the movie to take place, you know, in Manhattan, in New York, uh, the budget seemed to get smaller as time went on to the point where they were able to just film very little in Manhattan. And some of the things, like certain landmarks that were to be filmed in Manhattan, had to now be relegated elsewhere, and things changed. Um, but before I get into all of that first, uh, I'll show you the inside, which of course, as mentioned in the last few times, there is no other um, alternate uh, uh, poster as a cover, so you just get, you know, Jason when he arrives to New York, and this is what he sees. Uh, it's very wet in this film. Uh, Yeah, so, uh, this film is, um, again, not too well-loved by the fans, um, though I will say it's interesting how, you know, they don't have an alternate poster when there was one, but that caused controversy, um, to the, uh, New York tourist, uh, like business or whichever is in charge of tourism in New York, which is I Heart New York. Well, Jason comes and slashes it with a knife, and you see him with the hockey mask and all. That garnered controversy, and they removed it. So I don't know. It's been years since, but and people know of that poster, but apparently uh, they decided to not feature it here, which. I think it's a bit of a shame, but, you know, if uh, they sort of stopped making those posters as soon as that garnered controversy, I guess I can understand why they didn't do that here. Um, so the premise is um, the class of Crystal Lake, uh, graduating class, goes on to a trip to New York, and this, by boat, and this uh, causes a lot of questions, like, uh, is, since when is Crystal Lake now connected to the ocean, like, where, is there a big enough, like, river of sorts to go into, that's connected to the Crystal Lake, that's big enough that you can then get on this pretty big boat out to sea and to New York. Uh, you know, people have questioned that for a long time. Uh, but that's what happens. Um, you know, uh, Jason is electrocuted back to life from a cable that he is next to, or is that gets towards him and because uh, of a Boat on the lake with a couple, teenage couple, and the boyfriend tells her about the film, or about the, not the film, yeah, he tells her about this movie. Uh, that'd be interesting, uh, telling what's going to happen before it happens. Uh, but he, he tells the story of Crystal Lake, 
and this is Voorhees and Jason and all that. I guess I guess she either is not a has not been a permanent resident in that she has lived there her entire life, or maybe she did, but for whatever reason, all of this was never mentioned at all uh, to her at any point in her life if she lived there, which is interesting. But anyway, you know, there's just another summarization of everything that happened up to this point. And, uh, yeah, this film, after these two are killed, the whole boat thing happens, and uh, Jason gets onto the boat. And, you know, as time goes on, he does his thing and kills people. <laughs> um, there's a boxer, there's a boxing ring, there's a dance floor and everything, and it's also interesting how as the film goes on, you see a lot less uh, of the people who were there in you know, the beginning. Like less and less people, you know, Jason doesn't kill them, though of course there is a storm that happens, and so, you know, there is, uh, the boat sinks, but even then, you don't see a whole lot of people rushing towards lifeboats or anything. Um, and then there's Jason that would prevent them from going towards the lifeboats. And so, while they're all distracted, you know, they keep either killing them or they die from drowning in the storm. Or, you know, that's just something that is interesting as the film goes on. You know, that happens. Um, uh, the main character is, like, you know, her name is Rennie, and she has a fear of the water, but uh, she's graduating. And uh, her uncle is a teacher at this high school, and he is our guardian, and he basically has been... Uh, he, he basically didn't want her to go because of her fear of the water. But she kind of wants to go to sort of like prove that she can, you know, be out there and be fine. Uh, uh, and as the film goes on, you find out what led to this. And also that she sees Jason as a kid, also in the flashbacks when she's in the water and grabbing her and everything, like pulling her down. So it's quite uh quite odd essentially to say the least how you know she saw Jason in the lake as a kid and he was a kid um, and you know in this film by this point it's supposed to like take place like in the 90s or something you know cuz considering the timeline and how old, Part 4 was 84, and 5 was like a few years, some years down the line, where Tommy was like 16, 17, and he was like 12, so like 4 or 5 years later, so that's like the ne near the end of the 80s, and then 6, like a year or two after that, so it's in the 90s, so this is like supposed to be like in the 90s, but of course it looks like the 80s, but that's if you really go by the timeline of this in terms of year. You look at how there's recurring characters and they age. And they age like a few years or so. And so considering how the first eight particular do follow a specific storyline, regardless if you like that storyline and how it ends up, you know, that's a different story altogether. Um, but that's just the thing that people, when they look at this franchise, they try to Analyze it in the in the sense of the beginning to the end of the installments. Um, stuff like that happens, and how when you realize, like we're like within like the '90s now, things do not look like the '80s, um, especially with New York. You can really tell, you know, there's like punks listening to hip hop for whatever reason, because you know punks like rap music. Um, you know, that's a thing. There's also, like, a big, uh, in, in like, a, in the opening, and then what you see later in the film with New York, Manhattan, Square, 
big uh, advertisement for Batman, which came out in 1989. Same year this film came out. So, you know, maybe they had that big yellow emblem with the bat. So, even though this technically, chronologically, timeline-wise, takes place in the 90s, apparently in in the 90s, that film is so popular that they just have that there. And there's other things like that in the movie. But that's just something that's interesting. Um, anyway, uh, um, amongst her uh, Rennie's classmates, there's uh, Sean. Who's like the love interest? Um, Julius, who's a boxer. Uh, Wayne, who's like kind of a geek. And who's like a film guy. And others. And Ken Kersinger is actually in this film, who will play Jason Voorhees later down the line. It was actually Kane Hodder's stunt double, because, you know, Kane is back as. Jason Voorhees, the first person to play the character more than once, and he had a stunt double, even though he was able to basically do all the stunts that happened in this film, like the studio wanted him to have one, just in case, despite him saying, you know, when he looks at the film and all the stunts that were required, there really wasn't anything that he deemed to be too dangerous that even he would say, no, he's not going to do that. Uh, uh, like there's a scene where Jason gets hit by a car. Like he, he could do that. He was fine with it, but they wanted the stuntman to do that for him. Uh, and so that's what happened. Um... It's also interesting how Ken Gersinger gets uh, later in the film when they're in New York and uh, running from Jason. Uh, Rennie. <laughs> yeah, they, they run into a diner, right? Rennie and Sean. Um, uh, Jason comes in and uh, Ken Gersinger plays like a guy who works at the diner, kind of looks like he like washes dishes, might like, cook food or whatever, and he goes to try and get Jason out of there, but then Jason just throws him against the, throws him over the counter, and he breaks like, a mirror, and everyone's like, oh, okay, well, nobody tries to stop him after that, uh, Um, there are some cool moments, uh, like uh, JJ, uh, who's a guitarist, she loves guitar, and uh, Wayne is filming her like for like a music video, and uh, she comes into contact with Jason on the boat, and uh, he kills her, but he she's running away, and he gets her guitar and just kills her by hitting her with her guitar, which is kind of interesting, but you don't really see what happens. Um, there's other kills, like, you know, Jason takes a woman who's trying to seduce the teacher, and, uh, you know, she's not, uh, she's the kind of character that you just want to die, and then, uh, you know, she goes to Hi, Jason finds her, throws her, and breaks uh, the mirror, and takes a shard of the mirror and just stabs her with it. And you know, that really sucks for her. But uh, yeah, the uh, the uncle, the teacher, uh, yeah, he uh, he's a uh, uh, he's kind of a real scumbag. Um, and especially later when you find out that it's, uh, he's the reason Rennie, you know, is afraid of the water. Like, she didn't know how to swim, and he wanted her teach her to swim, so he thought the best way is to push her in the water and have her swim. And she almost, like, drowned. 
as a result. You apparently she saw Jason there. So, you know, and throughout the film also, up to that point at the end, we see sort of visions of, uh, of Jason as a boy, and uh, it's interesting for sure, especially since like, it's been a while since, you know, he's been a boy. So, I believe that was the director's son. Um, and one of the most memorable deaths is Julius's, where, you know, fights Jason on a rooftop. He's boxing, he's hitting him over and over, and just wearing himself out. And then when he is too exhausted, he just tells Jason, Take your best shot, or whatever. So Jason just grabs him by the collar of his shirt, and then just knocks his head off. And the camera, for a moment, is his POV, it's just spinning downwards. And then you see it go into a the roll into a uh, dumpster. And later, when uh, they're, uh, after uh, Professor dies by being like drowned in some disgusting goop, garbage, whatever, full with who knows what and dead rats, uh, which is sort of an unsatisfying way to end. Like the real jerk of the last film was cut uh, with a, a weed whacking saw blade, and then this guy just basically gets put into some disgusting trash can water waste garbage it's kind of quite un very unsatisfying um, but he dies um, and also a good teacher who's there she's uh, she gave Rennie a pen apparently uh, Edgar Allan Poe used to write with it and uh, you know there's a police car and uh, Jason is killed by the cops and then the or kills the cop, and then uh, they hit him with the car, but then they, uh, people, uh, uh, get out, except for the, you know, good teacher, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, he, uh, she's unable to get out, and then the car blows up, and also Jul Julius's head is also in the car because why not and then also the uncle dies afterwards but you know I guess it's kind of better to talk about the disappointing one before you know you see a huge explosion um, also although in this movie Jason does uh, save Rennie from being raped because uh, there are some druggies who once they get to New York uh, she's kidnapped and they go, the, the uncle wants to find the police and everything and they inject her with heroin, uh, knock her out, and she passes out. But then Jason comes and kills the uh, kills the guys. So, you know, Jason kills a lot of people, but you know, he he does save uh, you know some who are in the midst about to be raped. So there is that. Um, I guess it's sort of better than what and some films like with Freddy Krueger. They sort of allude to with that character. Uh, you know, Jason kills rapists. Um, so there's that. Um, yeah, so, you know, eventually there's like this toxic, like, waste, apparently that happens every night in, uh, in New York. Like, they eventually go to the, into the sewer to try and escape Jason, but he's there, he's like in the subway and everything, and they, they, every time they try to get away from him, even when they think, oh, he's electrocuted or something, he's still there. And, you know, they, they get to the sewer. <laughs> sewer worker says, you know, they, there's like waste or something that comes down there. Like every night at a specific time, and it's almost that time, so they need to get out. But then Jason's there, kills that guy, of course, and he's about to. Kill Sean, but that doesn't happen, and uh, she 
Rennie finds a like a bucket of toxic like waste or something that's there because you know why not keep some toxic waste despite toxic waste always coming in <laughs> flooding the like the sewers at night anyway you know, there's just like a container or bucket or whatever and she throws it on Jason's face and it like melts off the hockey mask and you see this horrid horrific face and it looks very horrible and she's uh, uh and they're running away and Jason's a bit weaker now and then he's trying to get to them but then it the uh, toxic waste is flooding and he gets swept up in it and the last thing you see is he's a little boy which the director thought kind of came full circle with the first time you ever saw Jason. Whether that works or not, uh, I don't know. I'm quite mixed on that. I mean, I kind of understand how uh, that sort of makes sense in that, you know, there you go. There's the sort of, uh, you know, there you go. That's the a tying up a full circle of such of this franchise because I guess at a certain point this was going to be considered the final installment and even on the back here it uh, says uh, one of his terrified victims escapes through a nightmarish maze of Manhattan's subways and sewers only to confront Jason one final time yeah and uh, that director uh, said I, I guess at some point he thought of this as the final film because he also wrote it and uh, Rob Heaton and uh, this is a uh, also doesn't have uh, Henry or Harry Manfredini's uh, score Fred Mullen uh, performed the score it's not bad but you know Harry Manfredini's, Manfredini's score is incredible in all the films he's composed for this franchise. But yeah, this is a, a film that not many people enjoy. And, you know, I enjoy it for the cheesiness that this film has. Um, I guess there are certain some echoes in that, you know, Rennie sees young Jason in her room like a vision and he's all wet and everything I guess sort of like a vision that like Tommy had in part five of Jason with an axe and everything um, perhaps that was supposed to be a callback to that um, which kinda does make sense uh, due to the fact that uh, until a little later she hadn't seen him as he was as an adult, so the only memory she has is him as a kid. But yeah, I I am able to enjoy this for the cheesiness that it has. Another installment really has cheesiness. Um, but yeah, this is a film that is seen as a low point by a lot. And it's also this film, due to the box office performance being the worst in the franchise, that they that Paramount decided to finally get rid of this franchise they sold it to New Line Cinema and uh, New Line Cinema owns Nightmare on Elm Street and in the midst of this you know and I think that even the director said you know he thought perhaps it could have done something with Freddy versus Jason and she said which I might have come out with it I probably but he probably wasn't the very first that seems like a very obvious idea but to get Freddy Krueger, but you know the studios couldn't come to anything with that at that point. They weren't able to come to any sort of agreement. So that film uh, had to wait some decades before Freddy vs. Jason ever happened. Um, so, yeah, this film uh, had promise in that the director wanted it to be mostly in New York, or at the very least, half in New York. But it was only able to film so many days, and yeah, if you've 
you you know all that if you've seen the <laughs> behind the scenes documentaries uh, about this film as well as even just the overall franchise. You know, the director, it seems like he really wanted it to be as great as it possibly could be, but because of the budget he was given and how many days allowed to be in actual New York, and instead Canada was supposed to double as New York City, specifically Vancouver. Vancouver and uh, New York do not really look alike, really at all. The most, perhaps... Maybe certain neighborhoods may have a certain look, like if they're maybe run down. But then again, you could perhaps say that about any major city. There could be you know, any run down neighborhood that needs to be improved, but just never gets improved. So, yeah, there is all of that with this movie. There's a lot of promise. And there's cheesiness. Kane Hodder does a great job, as he normally does. <clears throat> um, some of the other acting is fine, but uh, the characters, you know, really, by this point, there aren't as many standout characters. Um, not, that they, not that the protagonists and it's like survivors aren't good. It's just, compared to some of the other earlier ones, they're not as memorable. Um, and perhaps that might be seen as unfair in that, you know, like Tommy Jarvis was in three films. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to the budget and everything, the studio really didn't help this film at all. But then it granted how they felt about this franchise anyway. I guess it's not that surprising when you look at it like yeah it's fine to have Jason go into Manhattan but you can't really shoot in Manhattan except for X amount of days I think like a like a week or so um, uh, uh, I'm wrapped in Los Angeles so Vancouver Times Square is your sequence in the plot, but, uh, yeah. Five million dollars is, uh, what this film cost, and, uh, which was the, at that time, the, uh, highest, uh, biggest budget of the franchise, the biggest film budget, um, due to the locations, Specifically, being able to shoot for a bit in Times Square, it made fifth or fourteen point three million dollars, um, which is one of the biggest disappointments of the summer box office. It also uh, faced competition of Nightmare on Elm Street Five, The Dream Child, Halloween Five, Revenge of Michael Myers, and also Fright Night. Part two. <clears throat> um, it is the poorest performing film in the franchise until Jason X. Um, so, with all that in mind, and apparently also 1989 was not a good year for horror films in general. Like all those other films just didn't do as well, uh, particularly if part of franchises so yeah that is uh jason takes manhattan uh it's quite mixed uh moments of it that i think are fine good kills uh, a very a promising premise uh, director wanted it to be the best it could be unfortunately the studio basically didn't really help out when it should have. Because, you know, filming in a place like uh, New York is going to be expensive. They also filmed in Los Angeles, which was also expensive, but since a good bulk was in Vancouver, you know, they are able to save a good amount of money. Um, 
Sometimes studios should not cheap out, despite whatever they think about a franchise. You know, if a franchise makes money, that's pretty much what studios care about, especially these days. If it makes money, great. If there's potential in a franchise, then great. If not, oh well. Yeah, this film, for me, is has ups and downs. I don't think it's a horrible movie, but it is not one of the strongest installments. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, that's my thoughts on uh, Jason Takes Manhattan. It's quite, quite a ride to say the least. And uh, yeah, I uh, hope you all have a great day. Have a great weekend and a great week, and I'll see you all next time.